Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. Wow. I don't it was know. that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This is podcast number 101. I'll stop doing the numbers next week, but I like 101. It's a good number. This week's storyteller is Christine Gentry. The story was recorded in September 2012 at Union Hall in Brooklyn. The theme of the event was animals. So my dad is only five feet, nine inches tall, but he's probably one of the most intimidating men on the planet. He's one of those uh, ex-Air Force Vietnam vets uh, who never talks about what it was like in the shit and rarely talks about what it was like anywhere else. He's not real good on the processing of feelings, Uh, but he's fascinated by animals. And I've come to realize that a lot of what I know about him and myself and the natural world has come from the animals that have come in and out of our lives. So lesson number one. Don't give a rat's ankle what other people think of you. We grew up on the poor side of a large suburb in Texas, and most of the houses in the neighborhood where I lived in did not have fenced yards, uh, front or back. And because we were so poor, most of the meat that we ate came from animals that my father had killed. So it was a regular vision uh, for my father to bring home a deer and string it up by its hind legs in our chinaberry tree and gut it and butcher it in front of the entire neighborhood. And this was like my first dissection. It wasn't weird to me. It was just parts of animals and how they worked. And my dad would call me over and show me all the different parts. And it was totally normal for my mom to tell me to call my dad in for dinner and for me to go out into the backyard and see him running a deer head through a table saw (laughs) because he wanted to keep the antlers for the living room wall. And whenever a mother would pass by and shield her child's eyes from the gore, he would say, let him look. (laughs) For an elementary school show and tell, my father encouraged me to bring a black widow that we had caught on a camping trip and kept in a jar. I was pumped about this. I couldn't wait. I was going to show my elementary school classmates all the desiccated cricket bodies at the bottom of the jar and how cool it was that she killed them. And I was very disappointed to report to my father at dinner that night that most of my classmates started crying when I (laughs) pulled out the (laughs) And he goes, ah, don't worry about them. They're being a bunch of babies. A few days later, I woke up to find that this black widow had laid an egg sack, and it was beautiful. It was laid in a hammock of silk attached to the lid of this jar. And when my dad got home from work, I called him in to show him the egg sack. And I was like, can we keep it, please? Because in my mind, like the fantasy of some Charlotte's Web, like little, little baby spires swinging from silk and saying, like, good morning, Christine, good morning. <laughs> And my dad was like, now listen, the last thing we need is a house full of widows. (laughs) 
and we had punched air holes in the top of the jar. And he was like, there ain't nothing can be done. We got to take it out. So in a like ceremonial, beautiful gesture, we opened the jar and laid it at the foot of a yucca plant in my suburban neighborhood. <laughs> there were black widows and roamed freeze. <laughs> Lesson number two. Ain't no use crying about things you can't do nothing about. <laughs> One of my earliest memories is a fishing trip to my grandparents' house in Gun Barrel City, Texas. And they li- <laughs> It exists. <laughs> Look it up. And they lived on a lake, and we were fishing. And I was with my granddad at the bottom of the dock, and he caught a fish and pulled it up, and... When it landed on the dock, it was flopping and gasping. It was very disturbing for me as a child. So I turned around and ran to my dad, and I bear-hugged his legs. But the problem was that my dad was standing with my uncle with a fishing pole like this, and the hook oh. laid right where my eye was. Oh. So I ran up and bear-hugged him, and that hook went straight into my eye. And, of course, I start screaming, and my dad kneels down, calm down, calm down. (laughs) And he takes my chin, and he moves it this way and that to get a good look at the hook. And it hadn't gone in far enough. It hadn't gone into the barb. So he just plucks it out, grabs me, holds me up, and says, Jan, take this one to the house and put some sporin in her eye. (laughs) She's going to be fine. My third grade science teacher had gerbils, and everybody knew that one lucky third grader every summer got to keep the gerbils all summer long. And I lobbied all year. I was like, I'm going to be that third grader. And I won, and in the summer, she was like, Christine, you get to take my gerbils. I was so pumped. But the only place that we could keep gerbils was in an aquarium on top of the microwave, which was on top of a rolling kind of container, which was in the dining room. So in order for me, a tiny little third grader, to take care of the gerbils, I had to climb on a chair and climb on the dining room table and reach over into the aquarium to change their water or their food or whatnot. And as gerbils are wont to do, they replicated while under my care. (laughs) And one of the babies was immediately my favorite. I named it Sparky. had a little white spot in its forehead. And one Sunday morning, I crawled up on the chair and crawled up on the dining room table and reached into the aquarium and scooped up Sparky. And I held him in my palm, and I was like, Sparky, you're the best. You're the best. And I was talking to him, and he got scared by something. He goes, eep, and jumped out of my hand. Now, I watched this baby gerbil in slow-mo fall the entire length of my body and the entire length of the dining room table and slam onto the linoleum floor. I scream. I scramble off the table. I go down, I scoop him up, and I hold him up to my face, and I hear him go, ah. Clearly not okay. So my shrieking calls my father into the dining room, and I just blubber something about Sparky, Sparky, foul, Sparky, foul. And my dad leans down, takes a good look at him, listens, grabs him by the tail and says, ain't nothing can be done, and walks through the house with me crawling after him, like, what? What are you doing? What are you doing to Sparky? And he gets to the bathroom, and he closes the door, and I hear, whoosh. We're late to church. Go on and get in the car. (laughs) On a middle school camping trip, I caught an anole. And I don't know if you know what these are. They're amazing. They're like the poor man's chameleon. They're cute little dudes. They're like this long and green with white bellies. And they could turn green or brown, depending on what they're on. And of course, this was like long before I worked at a zoo. I had no idea how to sex a lizard. He looked like a boy to me, so I named him Charlie. And I set him up in an aquarium, a terrarium, excuse me. I got potting soil, I filled it, I, I put plants in there, I would spray the plants with water so you could lap it up, and I dug crickets up in the alley, and I loved, loved, loved this lizard. And one morning I woke up, and there was a little egg and it was sitting in the potting soil, and couldn't wait till my dad got home from work. I was going to show him. And he got home, and I was like, Dad, 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 look at that little egg. Charlie laid an egg. 
and he reached into the aquarium and goes, that ain't an egg, Christine. He pulled it up. He's like, this is just a piece of potting soil styrofoam. Yolk. Started dripping down his fingers. And he went, oh, that's weird. <laughs> Guess we're going to start calling Charlena and walked out of my room. Lesson number three, dads don't know everything. On another camping trip, this time in high school, there was one of those thunderstorms that only Texas can do, like apocalyptic, huge thunderstorm, and it flooded. And my dad wakes me and my brothers up very early. The sun wasn't, like, barely up. He said, I want to show you something. Put on your rain boots. Put on our rain boots. We're like, okay. So we go walking through the flooded grassland, and we come upon this gorgeous dome. And it was this burnt orange color. And as we get closer to it, I realize that it's ants. It's ants. It's an entire dome of ants. Fire ants have this amazing adaptation. When their colony is flooded, they gang together and create a living raft of fire ants. They sacrifice the bottom level for the good of the colony. And I'm fascinated by this, and I'm leaning forward and watching them crawl all over each other. And my dad says, back up. I'm like, what? And he sprays the entire dome with off and throws a match. (laughs) And it lights into this macabre lantern, and he pushes it off into the water. My brother's like, cool! (laughs) I'm like, dad, what? What? And he goes off to do something, and I start searching for other domes because the fire ants are everywhere in Texas. And when I find one, I call my brothers over. I'm like, don't tell Dad. And go up to it, and I show them how if you take two sticks and you stick them into the center of the dome and slowly pull them apart, you can get an amazing view of the grubs. And if you're really lucky, you can see the queen and how much cooler that is and way more humane. When I was eight years old, my mother sent me into the backyard to get some ice cream for our guests. And since we were poor, we would buy those big buckets of ice cream, cheap ice cream from Sam's Club, and we kept them in a freezer, a large freezer in the shed. And I tromp through the backyard, and I open the shed, and I get to the freezer, and I shove it open, and I pull myself over the freezer, and I scream. Because inside of the freezer is a bobcat. (laughs) And it's hugging... (laughs) the ice cream (laughs) like this and looking up at me with a bullet hole right in the middle of its forehead (laughs) and I go back into the house and I'm like where's dad and goes he said where he'll be back in a couple hours and I sit on that couch and I wait and when dad gets home I stomp my little eight year old foot and I said daddy why is there a bobcat in the freezer (laughs) And he said, because it was there, and I wanted to show my friends. <laughs> I was like, Dad, you will not kill anything that ain't bothering you and that you ain't going to eat. <laughs> and he looks at his little eight-year-old daughter for a good, like, five seconds and goes, all right. <laughs> and shakes on it. And to this day, that man has not killed anything that ain't bothering him and that he ain't going to (laughs) eat. Lesson number four. Dads get softer as they get older. My parents moved to rural Maryland my senior year of undergrad, and my first visit home was pretty incredible. My parents moved to my dad's parents' house and kind of took it over. And so there's so many memories there. And the first thing we did is after dinner, my dad said, come take a walk with me. And I did, and we walked er across the property, which is 11 acres of gorgeous land, and we turned the corner after the barn, and there was this pond that was never there before. My dad had dug out a natural spring and created a pond and planted water lilies and filled it with goldfish, and there was a bench. And we sat on the bench, and I was speechless, and we watched the sunset. And I heard this, I was like, is that that a frog? (laughs) 
And my dad said, oh, yeah, it's Frank. <laughs> he comes around every now and then and says hello. And I'm like, who is this man? And what has he done with my father? And thank you. <laughs> A couple years ago, my dad lost his last dog. We had dogs my whole life. So this is not the only dog that my dad has lost. And he took it so hard. He was so heartbroken that my neighbor heard him wailing <laughs> through closed windows and had to come help him dig the grave. And this is a man I saw cry three times my whole life. My dad is 63 years old, and he'll still kill a groundhog with one shot if it gets anywhere near his garden. <laughs> And he'll kill a cat. A cat is fair game if it's in the trash bins. <laughs> but it does get one free pass if it has a collar. <laughs> but the last time I was home, I watched this man. I watched this man curl up on the floor with his new eight pound miniature dachshund. <laughs> on her little dog bed and play fight with her in what can only be described as baby voice. <laughs> Are you in my bed? Are you in my bed? And I realized in this overwhelming moment of simultaneous beauty and real horror, like how very devastated I'm gonna be when I lose and how much of me, the good, the bad, the smart, the stubborn, <laughs> the strong and the very scared is really just him curled up inside of me. Thank you. That was Christine Gentry. Christine is a high school English teacher at heart and is currently a PhD candidate and adjunct instructor at Columbia University. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have our magazine, archives of the podcast, and upcoming events. If you have a story you'd like to tell, we have submission information there as well. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, and Aaron Barker. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, Josh McCall, and Raffaella Bemin. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Union Hall for hosting the show, and to my dad for liking rocks. Thanks for listening. At the UPS Store, we know this upcoming holiday is when things can get busy for small business owners. You can count on us to be open and ready to help with every small business need. The UPS Store. Be unstoppable. The UPS Store locations are independently owned. Product services, pricing, and hours may vary. See center for details.